All right, we're recording. Well, let's get let's get started then. Um, welcome everybody. We're excited to uh, have another evening of a webinar, the third in our series. Um, it's been a fun journey to uh, to look at registration and DNA testing with Bob Van Kirk, and then uh, have to Dave Pratt talk us through some of the financial stuff uh, around cattle and and uh, all the issues that we face in depreciation and whatnot. Now tonight uh, is AJ O'Neill, a uh, friend, a board member um, who's going to present on the value adding of, of our carcasses through different cuts. AJ's a wealth of knowledge. Can't wait to, to like I said in the pregame here, uh, can't wait to hear you actually uh, present and then the questions that come from the folks that are on here. Uh, that should make for a fun conversation. Hey, before we get going, I want to open us with prayer, um, if you would, and uh, then we can start. So let me pray for us. Father, thank you for uh, today. Thank you for a day of a change up in weather around here, at least, where we wake up to snow on the ground and, uh, and, and different dynamics. Thank you for agriculture and how those dynamics come at us uh, quickly. Um, and we get a chance to be in relationship to the world around us. Thank you for AJ and for his relationship to uh, the food that he's putting on people's plates, um, both as a farmer and as a butcher. Thank you for the, the insight that he has, the skills and abilities that he has, the understanding of how things fit, of how you've made them. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to be in a webinar with him and to uh, share this time with with folks that care about um, learning, um, just ask that you would open our hearts and minds to be able to see, uh, to see what we need to learn, but also to see you and to know um, more of who you are and who we are in your world. Uh, give us wisdom through this process that we would know um, and grow uh, as as stewards. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So AJ O'Neill, good friend. He and his wife, Dorothy, have three kids, which you'll see at the end of the, um, the presentation, a beautiful picture of his family. But uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, man. And hey, there's my dog up on the couch in the back. I told you she'd be there real soon. <laughs> <laughs> all right, it's all yours. Uh, thanks, Steve. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for everyone for attending. I uh, appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to do this. Uh, shout out to Christian Ramsburg. Uh, for pushing me to do this him and i were talking about speakers and and who would be you know good for the group that people would be interested in and he said well why don't you give us a talk and you know we kind of said well what about and, and we kind of started the ball rolling from there so thanks christian for that nudge and uh hopefully it's something that we're gonna you know we, we can build on this um so what i'm the way i kind of decided to format this webinar tonight was I kind of want to give everybody just a little taste of, uh, of, of what we do, kind of a broad array of things. And then um, if, if your guys' wish and the board's wish, and we decide to you know, pick different muscle groups and really kind of hone in and get into some more detail on any one of these topics, I'd be glad to come back and do it here another time. Um, before I get started, I do want to put on my, uh, my Red Devon USA committee hat and uh, just go over a few announcements. Uh, at the end of this webinar, we're going to do a survey. And I appreciate if everyone would be able to give us some feedback on that. It kind of helps us plan what we're going to do for the fall and uh, and speakers and topics and, and things. So, you know, your input kind of is going to make the fall webinar. So uh, just appreciate that. If you could reach out to anyone that you think it would be enjoy this we'd appreciate that we'll also make it available on our facebook page um and we'll make it available on the uh, and forum page if you're not part of that be part of it it's a good group drill informal and uh and just support each other so that'd be great um <clears throat> we're gonna kind of for the fall series we looked at some different topics um one being jeremy Ng, talking about the evaluation of bull calf at weaning uh, Mark Reed's trying to put something together with a person from uh, Ohio State on 
uh, mineral pack, the, you know, the best bang for your buck. Um, kind of thinking about complementary breeding as well. Um, you know, what's your weaknesses and, and what can you, what can you pair up to complement uh, your herd? Um, and then maybe some round table discussion. So if you guys could just give us input on that, we'd appreciate that. Um, so I'll get started here. Uh, I'm AJ O'Neill. I'm 34 years old, going to be 35 years old. Uh, I've been in the meat business since my dad said I could, I was about uh, as high as a meat table. So I've been working with him for a long time. My parents had the business for 30 years. So it's just uh, something that's a passion of mine. I went, to, I went to college at Penn State. I went for engineering and uh, it just wasn't, uh, I, I enjoyed it, was there for several years. Then I went, got an associate's degree, went and worked in a, in a drafting place, uh, working on drafting for locomotives. And uh, it was just something about just while I enjoyed the draft and design, I was called to do something different. And uh, so I guess this, this is what it is at this stage of my life. So I've been uh, been working full time with my dad and I was doing, we do caterings. Um, we do lunch meats and make our own lunch meats and make our own homemade bread, have, uh, have our own deli, smoked cheeses, seafood, fresh produce. We raise uh, lots of our own vegetables, blueberries, um, do cover cropping on that stuff, I have high tunnels. So got a lot going on. Um, and then here in 2015, I started a commercial herd of cattle to complement that. Most uh, the farmers in my area were uh, getting Marcellus gas money at that time. And a lot of those farmers has a great opportunity and there's a chance for them to retire and uh, and finally live out the rest of their years um, with money in their pocket. And so a lot of those guys took it, but it left the void there. And we had a lot of trouble getting beef at our market. So I decided to start, uh, start that. And that was my first chance to kind of step out from under my parents' wing, kind of do my own thing and, uh, you know, get the trip over and fall down and and do some of those things on my end. So, um, <clears throat> so what I'm gonna try to cover here in this webinar is get the most out of your beef. Um, so I'm gonna show you some beef primals and how we merchandise them. So how we're gonna seam out the muscles, how we're gonna cut them and display them. Uh, at, our, at our shop, we do uh, full serve, or they, it's a self-serve case, um, meats cut fresh every day uh someone comes in and wants certain cuts of meats or thicker steaks you know we always are there to do that for them uh take lots of orders we make our own homemade hams for the holidays sell lots of prime ribs um so anyway it's going to show you some of the merchandising stuff i'm going to show you some case studies i've done where i've taken you know individual primals and as i break them down i'm weighing them just to kind of give you guys an idea of what the loss is and how to do your price points Excuse me. I talked to uh, I talked to Steve some about this, and I was going to give um, price points on my breakdowns on this, but I didn't want people to get caught up in um, you know pricing and and how it was done, and if they're getting more than me or less than me, and and I'll just say you know caveat right now is we're in a pretty rural area. Um, we do have a college pretty close by that that helps, but um, not a real high income area most of the stuff that was good industry around our area uh is gone by now and it's a it's a sad thing but uh we, we're very fortunate that people still support our our local business um and then at the end and i'm also going to talk about what to do with some call cows as far as finer process products right, here's a picture of uh me and my mom and my dad like i said my parents have they started the business in 1989. They had, uh, it started out with a business that was a 30 by 60 building, was a produce market, uh, strictly did produce in our area at that time, lots of canning. Uh, you know, people were preparing, they took care of stuff and made sure they had like a supply for the year. Uh, so dad, he would sell bit, uh, pallets and pallets of, of peaches, canned peaches and and so a lot of the fruit and stuff, that was the main business. And then 
as the bigger box stores came in, they kind of, they, you know, they started their, their price gouging. And so we kind of had to just keep evolving the business as we went. And now produce might be 10% of our business and probably the meat, I'd say 60 to 70% of our income has probably come from the meat. So uh, I'm real grateful for my parents have been able to work next side by side with my dad for the last 15 years and uh, been a great experience. Him and I laugh and share things every day and then we'll leave and go on a hunting trip and uh, we'll laugh and carry on more. So it doesn't seem to matter. Business is business and we leave it at the, we leave it, we walk out the, walk out the doors there. Um, I have two other sisters that have been very involved and they've all, they've both gone on, had their separate careers, but uh, they still always come back and help with some of our larger events that we do. We do a couple of catering events and the one, our biggest one that we do is we serve 1900 people in two hours in a full buffet style uh, pig roast. And so it's, uh, we get all hands on deck for that day, but so, so we'll start out here with the Chuck. Um, and I'm gonna reference a slide like this each time before we go into uh, the muscle groups, just so you have a reference on, on where I'm working from here. Uh, so that title decide chuck roast or so um, the chuck that we looked at typically if I'm doing custom cut for somebody we do quite a bit of quite a custom cut especially in the spring and fall and summertime we back off uh, doing catering and stuff but most people would just say they want chuck roast and then you can get the English and arm out of that as well um, we're just concentrating here on this chuck area so the chuck ends between ribs six and seven, and the ribeye begins between six and seven and goes to 12 and 13. The reason I bring this up is that this is a continuation, these chuck delmonicas is a continuation of that ribeye muscle carrying into the chuck. Now, you know, industry has made us separate it out and they've, they've said this is, this is where the ribeye starts and this is what you're allowed to call it. Um, so we call this Chuck Delmonico. It's just a continuation of that muscle down into the chuck. We will, uh, we usually cut four to six, depending on what they look like. Chuck Delmonico is into that chuck roll. And uh, so that would be, this isn't too accurate because this is further down into the neck, but it would typically be right here. And then on the other side would be your boneless beef ribs, and then you'll have a seam of fat right through it. So uh, that's what you're looking at here. We do we do chuck dells, we do the boneless beef ribs underneath where we cut across the grain. Uh, both of those, the chuck dells could be, you know, those are great on the grill. You could cook them on the grill, and and you'd be the customer would be very happy with that at, at the price point that it's priced. Uh, boneless beef ribs. I'm sure there's several ways to cook it. I'm not a chef when we do catering, but uh, most of the time, if I'm going to cook bonus beef ribs, I'll season it, throw it in a crock pot, and I might put bidets with them. I only cut them three quarters of an inch thick, and so by the time I pull them out of the crock pot, they're falling apart. Me, I, I like to put barbecue sauce on them. Some people like to put uh, just gravy over top of them, but anyways, it's another good cut of meat, something besides just, just a chuck roast, and I guess my other caveat to this is I know at the end of this, people are going to say to me, uh, you know, my butcher won't do those, won't do these cuts like you've showed me. And, uh, and I guess I don't really have a real good answer for that, except for that. Uh, I hope, I hope you can find a butcher that that would be willing to work with you and you could develop a relationship to where, you know, they would work with you and decide to do that. And possibly, you know, you just have to sweeten the pot and, be willing to pay more and talk to them and chances are they might be so busy but you might be able to start a relationship with someone new that's up and coming and eager to get business so um and then what's left over from the trim uh, we cut this so we'll cut the beef ribs off you still end up with a tail kind of on this end and then we turn that into stew meat so so a typical chuck roll if i put it up there i'm gonna get all of these in one i'm gonna get uh We'll move on here. I'll go into this is, you know, how do you, how do you price it? So if we're looking at a boneless chuck, I got the, if I was to take that whole chuck roll, 
it, and that's what I did. I weighed this up. It was 21.1 pounds. And you, if you take that at say 699, you're getting for your chucks, you're going to know what that muscle should yield on a price point. Um, and so whenever I cut it, I will take three to four chuck rows towards the next side. Like I said, there's, when you get around between ribs, like three and five, depending on how fat the animal is and what it looks like, you will get a pretty heavy vein of fat that will come through your chuck roast. And I'm, I'm sure you guys have seen when you pulled it out and said, yeah, that's, that's pretty nice because when I cut custom, if someone says I want my best, my best roast, I typically won't give them those roasts because they're not going to want that heavy vein of fat through there. So that's what we're eliminating here. We'll just give them the best leanest chuck roast, which is going to be from the neck until you know, that fourth fourth rib, third to fifth rib. Uh, then we got the, the boneless beef ribs is 3.02 pounds. And uh, the Chuck Delmonico's be about a pound and three quarters is what this one was on this cut test I did. Um, and then that left us with some stew meat that we did, which is four and a half, roughly four and a half pounds. Um, so if you take all of these, one, two, three, four, and add them up in comparison to this, you lost about four pounds of trim. So you're going to have to make up for that when you price these back into what you're comparing here. So um, for us, like our, our chuck roast are at right around $6.99, and our chuck delmonicos, we price them at $12.99. So just trying to give you an opportunity here to maybe take some individual cuts and allow you to make some more money and just help better market yourself to people around you. Um, I say, I would, I'd venture to say that if you have your own shop that most people around you are gonna have chuck roast available, um, depending on what time of year it is, especially summertime, you get overloaded with those chuck roast because people aren't wanting to do that. They're wanting to grill. And this is opportunity where you can do some of that. Boneless beef ribs, you could also, you could probably sear them and then turn them back and if you don't want to grill, you could wrap them in foil and kind of allow that to steam through and to give you a little bit more tender of a, of a cut on those. Um, and I put this in here, this is kind of fun for me because being in the meat industry, about once a month I have someone come in and say, have you ever heard of this steak? Or have you ever heard of a Kansas City Strip or a Vegas or, or something? And I just said, well, do you have a picture of it? Because they haven't, cows aren't raising any new muscles on them typically. So it's just a matter of what someone's marking it and what they're calling it at that time. But the Delmonicos, so we call them ribeyes at our place. So people call them Delmonicos. But the definition according to Wikipedia says, uh, it's usually a ribeye. It's a thick cut portion popularized by Delmonico's restaurant in New York City during the 19th century. So according to that, they it's just a thick cut. So it could be any loin muscle. It could be a sirloin that they presented as a thick cut, whatever they had on the menu, they would just call it the Delmonico because that was their name, like calling it the O'Neill steak. And then it could be, whatever I wanted it to be that week, whatever product I needed to move. So that's just kind of a, kind of a fun blip there for you guys. Um, and then you have to ask yourself a question, were these better quality, more unique products? So are you more marketable to other people that I might come down the road and say, you know, I, I think I'd go for some of those, those Chuck Dells uh, this week and they might come down the road and see you. Uh, next muscle we're going to move on to here is the sirloin. Um, this is going to be the knuckle. And so sirloin tip roast or um, here's going to be a sirloin tip roast. And most people are, this is standing on and, and the knuckle is going to be on this back side here. Um, most people are just going to say, I want a sirloin tip roast. And you're going to cut three or four maybe two and a half, three pound roast out of that. And then you call it a day. And if somebody is, wants to kind of be fancy and they don't want a bunch of roast, you might cut them into steaks and say, you know, three quarters of an inch thick. Well, that's a, that's a pretty big steak. And as you get towards the end of this, you're going to find out that 
it gets real heavy grizzly. And I'm sure you've seen that in some of your race. We have maybe one or two real nice sirloin tip roasts, and then these these gristle veins here are going to get real heavy on the back side towards the knuckle. Um, so what we'll do is we'll take this cap right here, we'll seam this muscle down. And that's what I laid out here. So this is a uh, this is what we're going to call sirloin tip fillet. And this is what we're going to call our sirloin tip steak. Um, this muscle here in the next slide I'm going to show you, I actually cut this in half long ways. So you kind of get that fillet, that smaller portion look of a fillet. Um, and so here it is laid out. So this is our, we got six sirloin tip steaks. Got these three quarters of an inch thick. And then we got the sirloin tip fillets here. Like I said, I cut it in half and then we portioned them down. And, uh, and then I got left with some, some meat that we call it shish kebab meat, uh, sirloin beef tips, either one. Uh, and here's how I have it laid out on the tray. So it kind of gives you that nice looking like flat, it's a nice little packet, you know, maybe a family too, or, or they got a younger kid, you know, that would make a nice meal for them for a night. Um, and then the shish kebab meat. So what's the numbers? So here's a, so we got the beef knuckle. Uh, I got sirloin tip roast, which would be 10.95 pounds, almost 11 pounds. Or you could seam it out and you could have your sirloin tip steaks, four and a quarter pounds. You'd have your sirloin tip fillets, maybe about three pounds. And then your sirloin beef tips, you're a little over a pound and a half, 1.67 pounds. Um, and we always advertise, we put a big sticker on and say, this is great for shish kebab seasoned. Uh, in the summer times, uh, usually sometime Memorial Day, 4th of July, we don't do it all the time, but we'll come out and we'll make sure we got fresh zucchinis and squash and tomatoes and mushrooms. And we'll make our own shish kebabs. We'll put like four pieces of the shish kebab meat on a skewer, lay out a nice presentation for people. Um, might just, I mean, that's just a good marketing thing. People's gardens start hitting. You could start saying, hey, some, come get some good shish kebab meat, grass fed shish kebab meat to throw on your, to mix with your vegetables, throw on the grill and you know have a good cookout for the weekend. So again, you're going to want to just take this sirloin tip roast times whatever you typically would get for your price point on sirloin tip roast and make sure that when you factor all these things in, whatever your pricing be, you're at least equal to that price point or I'd say more than likely you, your butcher is going to charge you more. So you probably want to be about 30%, 40% higher at, at the minimum. Excuse me. Okay, so move on here. Uh, this is going to be the, the ribeye. And so bone in or boneless. <clears throat> so here's a picture of the hanging on a carcass. Um, and then here I'm moving over and this would be, I took, I chimed, I took this bone off right here. So I chimed that bone off. This is what you typically would get out of a rib steak. Um, we cut rib steaks. You're going to see this was a, this was a heavy fat and this is a mature animal but it had it had nice muscle in there and they usually typically would be maybe half of that and that muscle is only going to go for i don't know maybe four or five steaks in there uh, some people if i would if you would do a ribeye you're going to take this whole cap off of it where if you kept this as a bone in ribeye you'll typically typically incorporate that in and so then here's our boneless we're taking the we're taking this cap off and then we're going to take this piece and pull off. Now, typically, if I'm doing this for my case, I'm leaving that. I'm leaving some of that tail. I'll cut some of that heavier fat off of that. But typically, I'll leave a little bit of that tail. That those two muscles there, that's good on a ribeye for the tail. But depending on what you're trying to do, um, you might you might clean that up. And so there's a picture of that. And so the tomahawk or not. So here's how I do tomahawks. If you would go back, you're just going to, you know, leave five, six inches of handle on there. I'm sure everyone's seen these. 
I did chime the bones on that. So that way it just does, it makes it nice. So you don't cut through the package. It gives you a nice presentation. And also it helps typically to round out uh, your ribeye. The other thing I'll, I'll mention too, and I don't know, some butchers do it and ours, the guy or the slaughterhouse we used to use, they used to score the bone. So what they would call that would be like right here in the middle of your rib, whenever it's, maybe I can go back this slide. It would be right here. They actually take a little, a little saw and they're able to score that. And what that does is when that animal is cooling down, it allows this ribeye to, to round out and allows it to be fuller. Um, and the place that used to do that for me, uh, you know, some of their, they actually had a, had a fire at that location and no longer doing that for me. And the new people just, they don't want to be hassled with it. But if you can get them to do that, it'll make so much difference. It really does round that out and make that look really nice. Uh, and you just want to ask them if they could score the back of, of your, your front quarter. Um, so anyways, back to the tomahawks. That's basically what you're, what you're left with. I mean, it is a, it's a novelty item. I'll say as a tomahawk that you're going to want to leave a whole rib on there. And so if you're doing your typical ribeye, you're only going to have six ribs. So now you only have six steaks to sell rather than 12 to 14 steaks like you could get out of a ribeye. Um, so now you're thinking whatever you got out of a whole ribeye, if you total up all this, it would be 200 bucks, $250. You're going to have to be in that $40, $50 price point per steak. So you have to think it will will your you know environments around you will they support that will they be into that and for me we don't do this very often and then whenever i decide to do it and i put up on social media i'm i'm fortunate enough that a lot of people that surround us that you know they they'll grab those up right away and uh, i never have to freeze them but just an interesting thing to do you can see uh, right here my price point was $16.99 a pound that put us at $40 uh, per steak, which is, that's pretty cheap. The guy I know that uh, custom grades this for me, he used to raise grass-fed beef on his farm and then he he retired his own herd, but still, they still I graze on some of his, um, but he was getting $60 a piece. So, but he also still had them in his freezer. So, you know, I guess you can ask whatever you want. It just depends on how quickly you want to move it and how much profit you want to try to make uh, for each item. And so then I go on here and it's an or seam the ribeye. So if we go back, let me go back to this one. So this is this is going to be the end of the ribeye. That is, this is going to be between the 12th and 13th rib. So it's kind of hard to see here. I wish I had the other picture of the other side because that's where you're going to have more of your cap is on the other side between your between your six and seven. Um, so basically I pulled the cap off which would be, you know, come around here. And then all this fat I took out and I took this little bit of gristle out of there, took the tail off. And then you'll see right here, this, I guess this is the view. I should, sorry, I should have been looking at this one. Anyhow, this is, this is right next to where your chuck's going to be. And this is right between the sixth and seventh rib. Um, so this little piece here, I don't know how many of you guys fight over that, but my father and I, whenever, if we'd cook up four or five steaks and this was, and I was the first one there, I'd go in and I'd, I'd peel that out of all four of those steaks. And I'd say, okay, dad, you can have the rest. And he'd come over, oh, he did that. You know, he'd know right away what was going on. But uh, this is called the complexus muscle. I'll show you this on the coming up slide. Here's the cap that I would have pulled out. And then you're left with this, this nice ribeye, all lean, no trim. So um, in my opinion, I mean, my son's 11. He loves to have uh, filet mignon because there's no trim and he can just enjoy his eating experience. Uh, but for me, there's a, there's a texture difference. And I've had, I've had Wagyu beef and I've had, um, you know, some of the, I got, I ordered stuff even from the Kansas City Steak Company because I had never, I had never tried that Wagyu and I really want to try it $60. But there's something about 
the ribeye and this piece of meat and this piece of meat that it that gives you you have more of a solid bite or something it's not just this kind of like dissolve in your mouth you actually have something you can chew on and for me that's what i like about this cut that's why i would say i would market this better than a filet in my mind and then this is very good and you're but you don't have hardly any of them and it depends on the size of the animal um some of the stuff i get in we do buy in box beef at the store and i'd say most of those animals are probably uh carcasses are probably a thousand pounds i'd say i'll uh, say so quite a bit bigger than what most people would be doing uh with the red devons and the red devon i i try to focus on carcasses 650 to 750 i've gone as high as eight um for some fatter animals but so my point being in that is i don't know how big this muscle is going to be for for you guys when you narrow that down and even on this animal it wasn't real big i mean you're only looking at a couple pieces out of that anyways as a medallion but let's focus in on this this cap so this cap piece is that's unbelievable for me what we ended up doing was kind of rolling this like a pinwheel and then you can see where we clean this up so i i made this into a pinwheel tied it about every inch and said i'll come back and i'll just cut across in between the strings so that way that string kind of holds that pinwheel as a nice looking medallion then the same thing here when I cut across these nets I had to try to make be careful that I, I come straight across there because if you kind of end up touching all those nets across there then it kind of leaves you with a little bit of like that net residue which is kind of a pain in the butt so I don't know this thing I could have the other thing I've, I've seen where people actually will cut this muscle in half again and make it more like fillet size depending on how big it is and what you want to do um yeah, so here's the cap, here's our complexus muscle, and here's the ribeye. Um, some options for this cap, rather than do just a like a pinwheel like I did, you can also cut this into strips long ways, and you can saute them and put them kind of going back to uh, your shish kebab. You can put them on a skewer where you kind of fish it on like a worm or something, and you could almost put pieces of vegetable in between that and make it look like a real fancy plate. Um, you could also just take these and they, you could cut them long ways like this, similar to what someone do with a flat iron where you're just sticking a flat piece of meat on the grill and it's not gonna be super thick. You're probably thinking maybe about, it'd very be comfortable with the, what a flat iron is, maybe half inch thick, maybe three quarters of an inch thick. You know, throw that on the grill. And you could, you could do it like that. Um, for marketing purposes, we wanna tie this up and make it look pretty. And this is what you got. This was my little preview that I put up on Facebook this week, uh, just to kind of in intrigue people about tonight's webinar. But you can see where these rolled up super nice. I mean, these these things are melted in your mouth. And uh, so we just put these out like five per package. Um, and I will and I'll say this. You'll see it on my next slide. But I'll I'll tell you about it now that when I did this moving from a ribeye where we were charging $15.99 a pound in order for me to get the same cost. And I didn't really count in my labor of having to having to baby this thing along and do this. It's more kind of a trial I wanted to show you guys. It wasn't something we typically market a lot of, but being we had a busy weekend coming up, a nice weekend, I said, let's, let, dad was all right. He said, let's try that. And uh, we were kind of hoping a couple of these might not sell we could take them home and try but we didn't get to <laughs> so anyways they did sell but we had to add 10 bucks a pound I, that actually surprised me pretty good that i ended up you know for 15.99 i went back and i said hey for us to to sell the same amount of, we need to be at 24 26.99 a pound on this stuff which was like i say really surprised me and again this was a this was kind of a fatter rib eye and i had a little more to trim but uh it was just, it kind of gives back the novelty item. I don't really think people were even concerned about looking at the price tag. When they're looking at something like that, they're just thinking about their eating experience and uh, and they're happy. So, and I think they would be real happy whenever they ate it too. Um, other idea you could have done with the ribeye was uh, to make these petite roasts. So I did see where they netted them and then they just, you know, cut them like this. 
come like this. So maybe break that into like four rows. Um, but there's lots of ideas you guys can do. And then here's how I, this is how we package them. Great on the grill, ribeye. So I told you I package these in five. Um, right here's a blank spot where there's no piece of meat. And so, you know, merchandising tells me let's cover up all those holes. So when someone looks at a package, they're just seeing meat. And that's what I do. So I, I cover up any blanks I have. I, I cover it with my with my stickers I have. And so we, we call these ribeye cat medallions and we call these uh, center ribeye fillets. And, and then we had some, I had a couple of chunks left over and we, we called them ribeye tips and they weren't, they weren't left either. So then we go back to our price, which do I pick? And so this one, I did put some numbers down and I don't really think that, I'm not gonna really say that this is, this is accurate, it's just something to, something to think about. So for the tomahawk, I weighed this muscle. This is after I, I took the bone, I took all the fat off, I trimmed in between each rib. And this is before I cut it on the saw just to, to pull the one rib sections out, the stakes. And so I was at 15.46 pounds. At 15.99, you know, I'm selling this for two, $247 uh, for bone and ribeye with cap on, as I showed you in that previous couple slides, um, 11 and three quarters pounds at $15.99, you'd be at $187.72. Uh, boneless ribeye with slight tail on, uh, six, 6.35 pounds, $15.99 a pound, you're at $101.54. Um, and then I said, if seemed like I did add $10 a pound, because you're going to at least have that. And again, I don't know what, how many butchers are willing to do that. That's something I do. I have a passion for this stuff. I enjoy it. I enjoy doing unique things in my area. And, uh, but you'd have to add the $10 a pound. And this is just kind of my caveat, many factors you got to think about where you're at, what you're doing, but sometimes you just have to take a risk and you just have to try things and say, I'm, I'm very fortunate. My dad always supports me. Anytime I come with ideas, he said, yeah, let's give it a try. And, you know, I'll do my best to help him market it and do what we can. And, uh, I'm, we're fortunate to have built a great clientele over the last 30 years. Um, and, um, they, everyone knows that we're not the cheapest around. And I mean, that's a well-known area that if you walk in our doors that, you aren't going to find cheap. You, we have a Walmart, we have an Aldi's, and we have another place that only sells select and no roll beef. They don't sell any choice. So we, you know, we specialize and we concentrate on just choice beef and up. And, uh, and then down here at the bottom, cold smoked ribeye. So a couple, well, last, last year around COVID, we finally received a new smoker. We had ordered it. I think it was about eight months getting made over in Germany. And uh, we got it hooked up with refrigeration so I can chill in that smoker as well. And we started doing cold smoke ribeyes where I'll just stick a whole ribeye on there and we'll cold smoke it for a couple hours. And, uh, and then we'll go and cut into steaks and you're left with, you can see a little bit of a, of a mark around the outside. You got that smoke ring around the outside. And for me, I didn't really, didn't really know just because it's on the cap and some of that people will trim off and not even one on the ribeye anyways and eat it if they're real picky. But this is great marketing for someone that just has propane grills and they don't, I mean, because you had the flavor of this smoked ribeye like you had been cooked it over a charcoal grill for an hour and it was just, it's unbelievable. And I, I have a pretty good following of people. I got one guy that he just buys a whole ribeye and says, smoke it for me. I'm going to freeze it myself. And I'm going to keep it. And that way I always have it on hand. So we give him a better deal and smoke it for him. And, and he's very pleased with it. Um, so moving on here, I guess we don't have any questions yet, Steve. We're good. Keep rolling. Yeah, you're good. No questions okay. yet. Although I'm writing a bunch down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, so then we'll go into the round here. I wanted to touch on that one. 
And it says, my comment, what is the least favorite cut of on beef? And so anytime I do custom beef and I get to the rounds, it, every time, unless someone's 60 or 70 years old, they'll say, I don't really like this round steaks. What else can I do? And these are the main things that I offer. Swiss steak, chip steak, with this sliced in like a Philly steak uh, for cooking on that. We slight, we're gonna chip that, that thin. And then whenever I get, I, I put it on a cutting board. I make it into smaller pieces. Um, I sprinkle with some of our AAA seasoning that, that we have, which is just um, garlic, pepper, and salt. And I got butter on there. And uh, I just cook that up in the skillet, put it over cheese and that's a I love it you can't hardly beat that because if you ever buy any Philly steak anywhere else it's it's really fatty and it's not out of a good cut of meat so anytime you can do this stuff homemade it's it's hands down you know it's top notch uh Canadian meat you'll get that you get some people that did that I actually had a guy I think he was three or four years ago that would have been uh I don't know, maybe pardon my English, but he was a doomsday prepper. And he come to me and said he wanted to do, he said, how much, I want a year supply of canning meat. I said, well, how much can you eat in a day? So we ended up making him 100 jars of canning meat that he took home and he was going to pack it underneath his bed for a rainy day. <laughs> so that's what he ended up with, canning meat. I uh, can do stir fry. Your roast beef we have our own deli so we'll do uh we'll do our own homemade roast beef um injected cooked and uh and we and we have it in our deli so slice for however people want it uh you can do top round steaks you can do bottom round steaks you can do either round um london broil would be just you know the, it'd be the top round just cut into roasts um, and then jerky meat pre-slice. This is an interesting one. We do lots of this in deer season. People will always say, hey, I want to make my own jerky and I don't have a good way to slice it and I don't have a good way to, but I really like, I got this little smoker or dehydrator and I have my own recipe. And so we offer this. We'll, we'll take their hind quarter, we'll trim it up, we'll freeze it, slice it into meat, frozen stick it back in a vac bag and give it to them five pound bags and then they can pull it out as they want and they can make their own make their own jerky so that'd be a neat item for for people i think uh it just seems to be a lot more even when i'm on social media there's always people that you know they're getting excited about cooking people i never would have expected they have a weekend off with their family might go camping and they're always looking to do interesting things um smoking and you know that would be something neat for them uh, and then jerky. So we make our own jerky. Uh, a lot of processors are doing jerky. This would be out of call cows. Uh, lean ground beef. So uh, Brad Gibson was good for this one. I see him up in, up in Canada. He's always, he actually has brisket mixed for ground beef. He has lean ground beef. And I think he has uh, like a fatty or like a ground chuck. So rather than just, you know, blanket, here's my here's my ground beef. He actually has it marketed out in three different ways and at different price points. Um, and steamship round, I don't know if anybody's ever seen one of these steamship rounds, but all it is is you take it off at the, at the knuckle where the shank would end and you just get this giant piece and it's tied up. And if any, if any of you guys would have made um, the World Devon Congress tour here a couple of years ago, we did one of these down at Jeremy's um and stayed up the night smoking it and uh boy did it turn out good so the steamship round it's an interesting one i maybe do one of these a year or maybe one every couple of years but every time i do one that I, I think i should do more hey um, aj real quick yeah. um there was a question uh if you could clarify what do you mean by chipped can you go back to that uh, oh yeah slide uh, oh chip, chip steak so all we're doing is taking is that it? Yeah. What's the process to do that? Oh, okay. So for chip steak, you're just taking the, you're just taking the top round piece or bottom round or the eye. And what I do is, well, prior to, 
last week. I got a new slicer, so I'm happy with I got a I got a new toy to play with. But anyways, prior to that, we would always just freeze it solid, go over to the bandsaw and uh, turn it down about as thin as I could, about a quarter inch, uh, maybe a little bit thinner, and just slice it off in frozen pieces. Huh. And uh, and then I would actually allow that to, that way you're not like sticking a big frozen chunk like this into someone's meat package and vacuum sealing it. I would actually allow it to thaw a little bit in my cooler, and then I would package it so you kind of end up, you end up with like little balls of meat, and they'll just, they'll, cut it thin but it's a real thin slice it's great for on sandwiches that's great hey and when i do that i i charge 75 cents a pound as a as a butcher shop to slice it for people probably not enough but anyways if that's yeah. what they like then at least i give them something that they have a value that you know they can enjoy so um but yeah, my new toy is now a, a bacon slicer or like this where I can I can just temper it down to like 26 and I can go and slice that stuff, shave it just about as as thin as you would a razor blade. So I'm pretty oh. excited. Just got to try that out today. Um, and here's a customer's favorite. Anytime around holidays, anytime people have gatherings, this is the this is the whole top round muscle off of a round. And this one here. It's going to range 15, 20 pounds. And all I did was tie it up. So this would be typically if this was a London broil, you would cut it across a grain like this. What This looks like it's more plump and round. Typically, it's going to lay more flat. But since I tied it up and I tied it nice and tight, it kind of shaped that muscle a lot better. And uh, so we'll tie these up. And that way when people you know, this is how they're going to end up getting it. But I'll, I'll then take this muscle and I'll put it into a cooking bag. I'll put a rub on it and then I'll inject it. And then this is end products. People can just take this and throw it in their crock pot, throw it in their oven, you know, whatever they have roasters and uh, put it in there. And then they can prepare for their party and come back and open that bag and they'll be happy with it. Um, I know a lot of, as Devon breeders, we all say you know, the flavor of the meat's all you need. Well, I have a decent amount of, we do a decent amount of feedlot stuff move through our place. So we do seasoning and to be honest, uh, just the way the country is, the palates of people, people like the seasoning, but there is definitely novelty to the grass fed beef and the flavor. It's uh, unmatched. So we definitely have a superior product, but uh, this is very delicious too. And then we'll go on to the short ribs. Okay, I just saw your question there. That question, Steve. Yeah. Okay, so we'll go on to the short ribs here. Um, they're gonna be on the rib and the plate. And so Steve and I had this conversation here a couple of days ago about, you know, what do you do with short ribs? I mean, typically they'll cut them three inches wide, three inches long like this, and then there'll be like three rib sections. They fit in a package. You can get them. And a lot of the older, the older folks, they just like to put them in a crock pot and that's what's good for their soups. And they're, I mean, I, I know nothing about making soups. So that's, that's not my, you put me on a barbecue grill, I'll, I'll cook about anything. Um, so anyhow, that's one thing you can do with short ribs. Korean ribs, these are excellent. I actually won't, I won't mess with this, but I'd like to do the Korean ribs. You get on, on the internet, you'll find Korean rib recipe. Um, and it's fantastic. We slice, you just take the ribs like you would, instead of cutting them three inches like this, you cut them about quarter inch to half inch thick and you'll slice them you know if this was laying on here you'd slice them just across like this plate like that and they'll be real thin and I actually had a lady that was from up in New York City that she happened to be buying beef off someone she's like can you make this Korean ribs and I said well I'm not sure what that is but I'll look and ever since I've done I, I do really enjoy that and so pretty much you marinate the ribs and their sauce that, that they would Korean style and uh 
you put them in a, in a skillet and fry them up. I'm sure there's other ways to cook them. I tried cooking them on the grill and it wasn't, uh, I got two little ones and, uh, or I could have been playing football with my older boy. But so I put them on the grill, walked away and come back and it was flaring up and there's, so that fat had, had dripped down and, and caused a big, big burn up. So you gotta be careful cooking them, but uh, they turn out real good. And then this one is interesting. I just found this here a couple of weeks ago that a company was doing this by me. And you can see, you know, Wagyu, short ribs, also buco. So Steve and I kind of talked about that and I did it today just for fun, just because I was like, what did they do? Now this is, this is well marbled ribs and they had to really trim these ribs good to get all that fat out of it. Um, and actually, I think if you look right here, I think you're going to see that these are cut like Korean style ribs, just the way that those are. But uh, anyhow, they, they just took these and they would have cut them about six inches long. And then they, and I actually don't even think these are still fastened on the, on the rib. The one I did today, I took three ribs and I, I skinned, I pulled these off. So I just had like this attached to a piece of meat that was out here and then wrapped it around and then put a tie around it and uh, turned out pretty good, but you do have to trim it up. And then I'm not too sure that you get this. So I'm not a chef. I'm sure there's people who do. If you gave me a recipe, I could follow it and I could probably make it taste pretty good. But I'm still not too sure that this appeals that much to me that I'm going to go stick this on a grill or stick it in the crock pot. I'm not too sure what they're, what they're driving at, but it does look neat. It's unique. So maybe that's uh, you come up with a good recipe you give your customers and you could really market the heck out of these. And I bet you'd probably be the only one in your area that's doing it because this is the first time I've ever seen that. Hmm. And then I have here at the bottom beef bacon. Um, I haven't really done beef bacon in that, in that form where and I talked to a guy that he's been in the business for a long time. He's one of my dad's good friends grew up with him and he's worked at, uh, at the slaughterhouse and uh, did all the finer process and was there for 50 years. And uh, he said they did try it. And he said it wasn't, uh, it was nothing mind blowing. The differences between that same muscle on a pig and the same muscle on a beef is that the beef, and you'll get it sometimes with venison, that the fat you get in your mouth kind of leaves you with like a, almost like a chalky, taste it doesn't give you that nice melting point where you're like hey this is you know this is a good flavor it carries the flavor across your palate it's kind of kind of sticks in your mouth and I don't know if you get this similar thing with beef bacon um but as we're talking about bacon I actually this week I made um turkey bacon out of boneless turkey thighs and it's actually a ground product which I so I grinded I've added um my cure and I actually put it in my tumbler and I mixed it. So this is actually a ground product that's reformed, similar to what you would do with like a restructured jerky. And we laid it out on a pan that's about like that thick and, uh, and then put a rub on top and smoked under my bacon recipe. And, you know, it turned out great as a turkey bacon. So you could do the same thing with beef bacon. I know guys are doing what they call venison bacon. And that's all they've done. They've just taken a, a cure kit and taken their ground hamburger and made their own bacon. So that's another option for, for things you could do. Um, AJ, before you move on, yeah, uh, there's two questions. Um, if you go back to, can you go back one more slide to the, there you go. Um, the question is, is this where the, or this is where the skirt comes from? Is that true on the plate or where does the skirt steak or the? Yeah, skirt is going to come from the inside. Like, so it would technically be the diaphragm of the beef. And let me go back to, I don't know if you can see it on my ribeye, right here. So this is, this is your ribeye. Mm -hmm. And if this was to carry on out, it would be where you're going to have your short ribs. So typically you, people would break it here and what you have left and as you see, like on this tomahawk, that's actually a part of part of your short ribs. Huh. But this is the skirt steak that's going to be part of that diaphragm. Um, so you can take you can take that off, and it would never affect any of your short ribs. 
Okay, and then one more comment was that the beef bacon uh, Deb had was was made from the brisket. Okay. Um, yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, because with that with the brisket, you definitely are going to get that that melting, um, and you're going to have that good flavor, just like you get with a good slow cooked brisket. So yeah, that's a that's a uh, hats off to your your butcher. That's a good thing. Awesome. Nice job. Keep yeah. rolling, man. All right. You're making me hungry. <laughs> yeah, I did see someone put that that comment on the Facebook thing. I better eat before I get on this. I know. Bar. I should have. <laughs> okay. What else? So right. there you go. Yeah. Yep. Here's where we're at. We're uh, marrow bones, also buco, cross cut shanks, whatever you want to call it. Um, beef knuckle bones, soup bones, and uh, and then your marrow bones. This is just a uh, this is just a femur bone split long ways, which is not a not a favorite of mine. I told Steve it did not like that because that bone always wants to roll around on you. You're running through a bandsaw. It just makes you a little bit nervous. You got to be careful doing it. So, um, and we so we typically we don't have a big market for soup bones. I'm surprised. I've seen people that are getting six six bucks a pound out of marrow as soup bones, marrow bones. That's an, that's impressive. I'm I'm happy for those people to get that kind of price. Uh, typically, we we just keep some soup bones, um, and then we'll sell these knuckles. We smoke everything. We'll put it in a, in a hand brine, let it sit down there for a week or so. And then, and then we'll smoke them and we put them out on the shelf. Some of the smoked dog bins, typically a whole femur bin. We can get, we'd get six bucks and we're, we're too cheap. I see if I go into a pet co or something, they're getting like 10 bucks and it's not even, and they even take a knuckle off and they'll give you, you know, part of a femur bin, maybe the knuckles attached but I, usually they'll clip off both ends and give you that middle chunk of a femur and uh and charge you 10 bucks where you know we'll we'll include that in ours um but and christian christian and i talked about this ramsburg he he said to me that there's there's a company that he knows of that uh you can send the bones out and they'll they'll get the marrow out of it and then they'll put it back in jars and and give it back to you to sell. So that's an interesting process, and that's a that's a great way for somebody else to make some money too. If you got any more questions about that? Then hit up Christian on that one. Hmm. And then here's some things to do with call cows. This is what we do. This is uh, this is a bunch of beef sticks, <clears throat> and this is this is our smoke truck. We did. We did a couple of trucks of them last weekend for our retail way to get caught back up. But part of what I was telling Steve about this was that, you know, when I, there was a guy that worked at the spice company years ago and we were talking about adding new flavors. And it's kind of funny that it went full circle because before I really had a lot of input and uh, my dad's pretty hands off. Now I take care of all the recipes and all the cooking of all the jerkies, hot dogs, sticks, ring bolognese. And this is pickle bologna where we just, we take this and uh, put it in jar, put it in pint containers or quart containers, I guess. And, uh, and we'll just chunk it up and put some crushed red pepper and some vinegar in it, uh, half apple cider and half um, white vinegar and market days. But anyways, my dad used to always want to make several different flavors. And when I was making, I said, Jesus, man, why do we have to have so many flavors of this? This is, this is get to be annoying. Can't we just have like four main ones and, and not have to keep making all these special recipes? And then I talked to my spice guy and he said, AJ, he said, you're going to have, you know, two, 200 customers on average walk through your door. And this is just hypothetical. Walk through your door on a day or in a week. And he said, rather than them, buying three packs now you're just going to buy one pack of each of those and you're still only going to have 200 customers and you just cause yourself four times as much work well i don't believe that that is even a true statement at all after 
what I've seen because every time I come out with a new flavor, we continue to increase production, increase production. So now I'd rather that people grab, you know, a pack of each or a couple packs of each. And uh, everyone, you appeal to different people on different flavors. I, right now I have a dill pickle snack stick. I have a, uh, have a bacon flavored snack stick. I have a honey pepper, I have a bourbon. I have two with cheese. Um, I'm actually, my boy and I have been talking and we're gonna come up with a peanut butter and jelly snack stick. So that's our new <laughs> one off that I'm trying to figure out how to come up with that one yet. Um, we do a horseradish snack stick. Um, and we come into the hot dogs. We do, for beef hot dogs, I just do two flavors. I do a beef and a beef with cheese. And then with a the pork, um, I got several flavors in those. And then beef jerkies, same thing I do. The newest beef jerky I come out with is the A1 steak sauce beef jerky. And it's just, rather than I use, like my typical recipe is uh, jerky with soy and uh, a little bit of water and then the seasoning. And we just substituted out the water and the soy for the A1 and it just soaks in that. And as soon as you bite into it, you just, you get that flavor of A1. So for the steak lovers, they think that's really the ticket. And then uh, here's ring blannies. You know, we sell a ton of that. It just depends what, what part of the country in it, I think you're in, whether that's a big ticket item. Um, you know, these rings cost about eight to 10 bucks. And most people, what they do up here is for hors d'oeuvre trays, where they'll take, they'll just chunk them down into pieces and make like a meat and cheese platter with, with a dip in the middle. This is stuff's all ready to eat. Um, my grandpa used to just take those and, uh, and make a sandwich. He'd just cut it long ways and, uh, and he'd just make his bloody sandwich out of that stuff. So, cool. and then hamburger patties, um, we're going sticking with the hot dogs. Here's, uh, here's our new nitrates added. So that was a new one we put out. It's not new. I mean, the concept has been around for, for Wow, that maybe maybe it's been longer than that. I, I want to say five years, but it could have been long before that. I was just way far behind sitting here in Clarion, PA. But uh, anyways, I had a uh, I had a girl that was pharmacist, and she kept coming in and saying, "Oscar Meyer Winger has these no nitrate added dogs, and they're so great." And I said, "Well, let me look into it." And I said, "Well, okay." Now I couldn't. None of my spice suppliers wanted to supply me a celery juice powder because you're just substituting um, your nitrate for celery juice powder, which whenever it's thermally processed, if you look on any of the labels that are approved, it's going to turn into a nitrate once it's thermally processed. So some butcher shops will add, will not add any nitrate or celery juice powder, and you will have like a gray dog that is pretty much almost like a just a cooked hamburger. Um, but if someone's actually substituting back in with celery juice powder and a cherry juice powder back into it, which a cherry juice would be like the sodium methorbate to help retain that color. You're still gonna have this nice presentation, nice color. Um, <clears throat> but it's expensive for us. We have almost a dollar a pound in just substituting ingredients. So, but I put it out there and my customers have not even, I still sell it. I mean, I don't sell them like I do the other ones, but they they buy them and they don't even seem to think about it. So I've continued to make them now. Um, so using the hamburger patties, here's some of the flavor patties. Of course, my, my spice companies love me. You know, they're in my ear all the time, but here's some new flavors we have. And so the bacon cheese patties, I just actually, take my bacon ends and I just mix them right into the burger. I add high temperature cheese. And uh, you'll see that with a lot of these, I use high temp cheese. This is a cheddar cheese. This is a bacon cheddar burger. Um, we do jalapeno ranch, mushroom Swiss, chili cheese patties. Those are just seasoning packets. The Italian pepper steak. We actually have an Italian seasoning and we add uh, some pizza sauce and some pepper strips that we cut and put in. And then with our flavor patties, Typically, I don't like to go through a like a patty machine because it's it kind of makes like a stiff, sticky texture. So we actually end up 
like hand scooping into like a six ounce or I, we have a vacuum stuffer that measures out by six ounce patties, but we still hand press them and uh, put papers in between them and then you know, sell them out there. We go on jalapeno Monterey Jack with hot pepper cheese, pizza patty with hot pepper cheese and uh, say, make sure you're using high temperature cheese. Um, I'm gonna let uh, Steve talk about this here a little bit too later on after I'm finished. He, he started telling me that he's getting cheese from somebody else and not high temperature cheese. Um, my spice companies like to sell me stuff and uh, they tell me you have to use a high temperature. We have used stuff that wasn't and it melted, um, but that's not, I haven't used every cheese in the world and Steve's found some that has worked for him um, without having, having that melt. But I like the high temp because I get it in like a quarter inch to a three eighths inch diced. So it's, you see little cubes. So whenever they're looking at a patty, they're seeing like this nice uniform, like little cubes of cheese throughout the patty. And uh, so it cooks up and it's, and they, they enjoy it. Um, and then I go on here, we can do meatballs, flavored meatballs. I do chili cheese meatballs. We've done jalapeno meatballs. Um, wedding soup meatballs these are just like real tiny meatballs that people like to put in like a, a wedding soup that you can have there um and we do lots of meatballs for catering um let me see if this chat is before i go on uh there was a comment about um cooking the shanks down to make beef broth oh okay um you know, we sell a lot of our bones through our store for that. People are, especially now, starting to really pay attention to broth making. Yeah. Um, there's a place up in Cleveland, Ohio, called Erie Bone Broth that will make broth. If you take your bones to them, they use organic uh, produce and put it put it with it. I mean, there's a minimum size, but it's um, uh, it, you get. I think they do uh, about three hundred. Uh, don't quote me on this. I think about 300 pounds. Uh, when we do chicken backs, we take about 300 pounds. And I think they're looking for similar lots. Maybe they could do a half batch of beef bones, so knuckle bones and any of the soup bones. And then you get back um, just packages of, of broth to sell. That's a great yeah. value added thing that we do. Um, so yeah, yeah. And, it's, and it's under inspection, so you can resell it too. Uh, another question here is, uh, are your meatballs pre-cooked or raw? Yeah. Um, yeah, so if I sell pre-cooked meatballs, um, I mean, it's convenient for people. I sell 12 to a pack, uh, fully cooked, brought the 156 instant. And uh, yeah, so they can just take those meatballs, throw them in a meatball sauce, throw it in a microwave, and then you have meatball sub in two minutes if you, you know, or you can throw it in a pan and warm it up so yeah we do all all of ours are pre-cooked i do like people that some some places have the ability to just make fresh i mean you can see how many products i'm doing we're just a small store and most of the time it's me and my dad and um you know a couple couple part-time guys but uh boy when people are able to do like that fresh like a meatball that sure is nice um but yeah we do we do cooked and when you're packaging it keeps its shape if you're trying to vacuum seal or do something like that with a with a fresh meatball, like say someone's going to sell it as in their freezer, it's just going to want to smash unless they have a real like they have a hundred thousand dollar sealing machine. Then they might be able to pull that off without smashing it. But uh, we don't have that. You can do what the uh, gas flush. So some of those systems, like you'll see with these bigger companies they are able to rather than taking all the oxygen out of the package they take out uh 50 and then they they flush the uh gas into it to try to even out so that way you can still you know it still does the same thing as a vacuum sealed package um and then this is what carcasses we like this is couple I raised, I told you about the guy that custom grazes for me. Um, we were loading this into his barn before he put it on my trailer, take it back to the shop. One of the guys I really respect and become good friends with, um, Glenn Alzinga, 
here on Zolder Spring Ranch. If you guys want to get ideas from a guy that is a marketing guru and his daughters, he's got like seven daughters that are, they're just geniuses at marketing. Go on to alderspringranch.com and uh, see what they do. They do really incredible work. But when he was in at our, at our event at Clarion, he said the one thing that he really likes about the judge finish is when they're standing sideways that you have like a 90 degree angle on that brisket. And that's what he really likes about his finish. <clears throat> as well as you can see this fat deposits on this animal around the tail. And then when this animal's looking at you, you can see just a nice full brisket. You don't have, you know, when they're younger like that, you're just gonna see this kind of like hang down, flopping around. But when you start seeing that fill in like that, you know, that's, that's nice. And these animals, these weighed about, I think they were 750, seven to 750 hanging, maybe even closer to 800. But the, these animals are nice. Steve asked me, and a lot of people asked me, you know, what si or how old were they? And to be honest, I really can't tell you because I bought them as feeders and, and I didn't track that age. But uh, but for me, it, what, it's not really, I'm not looking at the, the time clock and saying, you know, I really got to be careful about button up against that 30 months, I'm going to lose it. I mean, with all the stuff I've shared you today with other merchandise and other ways you can make your money back, my most important thing is return customers, quality products. So if it took me three and a half years to get that animal to look like that, my uh, better be charging a good amount of money for winter and taking care of that animal. But that's the product I want in the end. And I want that animal to be, to be fat. And honestly, to go, to keep pushing beyond this is a reason why Devon's really weren't in the feedlot program because they just, they finished too fast. And now from here, I, I'm not, I can't get into that 1200 pound carcass, whatever they, whatever they want. I'm not even too sure. I haven't been through any of those big packing houses, but because the Devon's fish, all it's going to do is throw on fat and then you're not going to get, you know, then they, they can't make their money on that too. So this is what I, this is what we like. Uh, for our carcasses and here's my fun family of course my wife has to have us in matching pajamas and she said here you go put these pajamas on and I don't wear pajamas but uh, this is our <laughs> Christmas card sure. and so it was fun this is our our 2020 so you got the Clorox wipes and the toilet paper since it was sold out and uh, then you got my crazy family and uh, <laughs> this is our gleam of light in the year of year of COVID so Super grateful for them and their support and everything they they do to to help me out. So and to keep me keep me pushing every day. Hey, by the way, Brad says we're all glad you're wearing PJs. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining, Brad. <laughs> Matt actually made the comment that uh, he's lived in many areas of the U.S. and worked internationally, and it's remarkable to know regional tastes. I think that came up oh, at the yeah. time you were talking about ring baloney. Yes. Um, it would be interesting to be able to see on the map, like what are some really unique regional tastes that we can uh, kind of drive our product to. Yeah. One of the guys that I listened to, <clears throat> Ravi Zacharias is a Christian apologist. I love listening to him. And he said, that's probably one of the, one of his most favorite things about moving from, the eastern part of the world to the western part of the world because he said in the west we just have like it's a it's a melting pot we have lots of different cultures and we have all these different unique tastes that we've all embraced in this area and uh yeah, it's a it is a blessing in the united states that we have this now some of the curse is that we season the heck out of all of our meat to try to give it taste <laughs> when we could be feeding them red devon grass-fed beef but uh yeah, we have that. My sister, my sister-in-law just came back from Mongolia. She was there for two years. And she said that, like, she said, I would have just cringed to walk in a shop over there. She said, you couldn't get meat. They had no idea how to cut it. They had no concept of like primals or what a cut of meat was. They pretty much just kind of lopped off a piece of meat and said, there you go. And for, in their world, you know, the fatter, the better. So if they gave you a real fat, animal you know they thought wow you should 
you better eat that that we had to fatten that thing forever and then you're throwing it away that was like a as disrespect to them so she's like she could not wait to get back in the states again and have food and she had the pleasure of living with me for like six months and she's like oh my gosh aj she's like i haven't got to eat like this in <laughs> forever that's great Hey, uh, if other people want to ask questions, we had another one come in. Um, Jenny says, thank you very much, AJ. This was super informative and it gave me a better perspective on specific cuts. You're fortunate to be the butcher to use such creativity. Absolutely. Oh, thank you, Jenny. Appreciate that. Uh, that is true. Um, and then Deb just said, great presentation, like seeing all the cuts and choices. Thank you. Um, yeah. Hey, I yeah. one question I had, um, so it was uh, to compare the sirloin tip filet in tenderness to a filet mignon or, or the, the tenderloin, and then also to the eye of the round. Um, what can you talk about that? Um, I'm, my, my remark to that is I'm spoiled and I don't grab a sirloin tip filet and take it home and cook it on my grill. <laughs> uh, <laughs> tenderness i would say that it's gonna be it's more tender than um than the eye of the round for sure and um what was your other comparison uh to the to the filet that we all um, know yeah, yeah the, the tender one we know yeah so we we cut it thinner just to be a little bit i don't know maybe a little bit more forgiving although i don't know that that's the answer i mean i think in my mind anytime i've ever seen a lot of a lot of people when they do sirloins, they have almost like this time I've seen people cook sirloins, it's always been on like a well done or like a medium well. So they already are okay with kind of like a drier steak and they like their A1 steak sauce. So this is kind of a cheaper price point that kind of helps to cater to that. Um, but I just, we just try to give a, a wide array of it and i actually have another presentation i could do i i excluded it from our topic just for time's sake but um we'll do the same thing with the sirloin a boneless top sirloin where we'll pull we'll cut like four or five boneless top sirloins and then we'll we'll pull like a filet out of that and that's a lot better choice than the actual sirloin tip filet hmm. so if you do out of the boneless top sirloin then it does better that's great. Um, so another question, when you talked about scoring the ribeye, asking your processor to score the ribeye to, to round that off, right? Yeah. Um, if you, when you do that, that's prior to hanging, right? That's right after they split the carcass. Yeah, that's, that's right as they split in the, the carcass, yep. Okay, and they just and It almost it. looks like, it would almost look like a, uh, I don't even, I'm, I'm sure you can buy them. Cause I, I thought about buying one to give to my slaughterhouse just so they would do it for me. But uh, it almost would look like a, like the teeth would almost be shaped like a butter knife. And you're just kind of sawing on that bone. So it scores and then you almost have to take your, the tool and like hit the bone. So it actually breaks. So you're kind of taking that bone and rather than being straight, you're kind of folding it around to you know, roll with that piece of meat and that's kind of rounding out your ribeye to make that, you know, that more presentable ribeye look. Huh, I got you. Um, there's a question on the Q and A. Are there specific cuts that work best with a Devon carcass? Are there other ones that don't work well with a Devon carcass? I'm trying to think if there's one that I don't. I'll say this that I used to when I first started raising cattle um, my buddy's a dairyman so I was getting Holstein bull calves from him and I was feeding them uh, like a no roughage diet so just um, you know all you can eat grain and protein 34 percent protein pellet and the drawback and why I switched to a beef breed I mean there's several reasons why I got away from that obviously my passion is you know improving the environment and the soil and returning to land and uh, getting away from this corn and soybean rotations and stuff that we're doing. 
but um, with the Holsteins, you always got a thin loin muscle. I mean, that was just their, their makeup of that animal. And so it'd be like, oh, these are great looking roast, great looking steak. And then the T-bone, your strips were just, they were just like, just small. And so you almost left it almost always as a T-bone because then it didn't show you how small the actual strip was of that, where with, uh, with a beef breed, and especially a Devon breed, you know, I don't have that anymore. I, you know, you can make New York strips and they, they look super. Um, so I, I don't think that there is, and I mean, lots of people could educate me on this, um, but just from what I'm seeing, I, for me, there's a lot of things that taste better. And as I've switched some of my customers over from for freezer beef to grass fed beef, um, I've had a couple people that were just used to like there some some of my customers I have in in the cities around the cities and they'll say that um, that there's just a there's a different flavor about that beef that you sold me and I said was well, it a good one and are you happy with it and he said well, I am, but he said, my, my wife just pointed out that we just weren't used to it. And so it's funny that, you know, this, this flavor that you're getting with a grass fed Devon carcass, when you're taking it, that they get these other flavor profiles that they're not used to. And their, their mind's trying to decide, like, is this a flavor I like, or is this a flavor that I'm not sure about? And so then I just sent them a whole gamut of things of, from Fred Provenza of why, you know, these, you're getting these flavor feedbacks while you're getting all these, um, well, it's ex escaping me right now, but uh, and why it is so flavorful and the nutritional benefits that you're going to get from it. Um, so it's it's an adjustment for people and I think you just walk them through it and they, they see your store, they, they see your grass and they see your cows eating it. And, you know, I think they adjust to it, but initially I think there is a little bit of a, of a learning curve that they're going to have to, that they do have to go through if they're used to something for 30, 40 years, a bland starch diet beef. So. Right on. Other questions from folks. You talked about the, uh, that high temp cheese. Yes. Um, the, uh, I tried to put some cheese. I had a processor try to put cheese into a hot dog mix that he was doing for me. And he, he said I needed high temp cheese, but I had found a, a grass fed uh, cheese from a place in central Pennsylvania called Clover Creek Cheese Cellar. Um, and when I talked to them, they said they thought maybe their aged cheeses would actually hold up under temperature. Um, they did an Asiago, they did a, uh, uh, smoked gouda that was aged for a while and then they did a uh, a clo what they called their clover which was a, a it was a cheddar smoked for a year or aged for a year and um, they're really dry um, and when we they actually ground it they had to grind it put it through the grinder and then send it to this processor to put in the hot dogs he was willing to test it and they held up and the the, the idea was that they were dry enough that when they I mean, they still melted a little bit in the hot dogs when they were grilled, but they didn't, it didn't all just disappear out of the, out of the meat. Um, and it was, it was fantastic in the snack sticks. I mean, we did an Asiago snack stick and it was just, it was really good. Uh, and then the cheddar too, and the hot dogs were fantastic. So hey, Steve, can you, can you put up the, uh, the survey? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Let's go ahead and kick that off. We'll launch the poll. So there's a poll now um, where there's, I think it's four or five questions we asked. And uh, if you all can take some time just to jump on there and choose or follow through with that, um, I'll, I'll answer or ask Brad's question. He wants to know when you'll be shipping to Canada. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't even think that uh, they'll let me get across there else I'd rather just deliver a package to you. That'd be my ideal thing. My wife keeps saying we need to get up there and see them. So I guess I could stop sharing. Yeah, so again, I don't know what what you all are seeing, but there's a, 
There's five questions on the poll um, and they are, um, there's one multiple, or uh, I think uh, three of them are multiple choice and, and two of them are just pick one. Uh, some of it has to do with the webinars that we already did and others have to do with um, uh, the webinars that are gonna come up here in the fall. But I can't edit this and I'm not sure. Maybe Becky, if you can uh, let me know if you're able to answer the questions, that would be helpful. Or Brad, since uh, you know, maybe you can earn some of your deliveries by giving us a little bit of feedback. Because it says at this point, zero of 10 people have voted. I'm just not sure how that. Uh... And yeah, Deb just asked uh, if, if this is being recorded. Uh, yes, it is. It's being recorded and Becky will have uh, the ability to send it out to you all. Um, we put it up onto uh, Dropbox and then she can do that. All right. Some of the votes are actually coming in. That's good. Uh, some of the questions don't apply to me, but it won't let me skip any. Ah, sorry. Didn't. Um... Yeah. I overlooked that too, Steve. Um, I guess just uh, pick one you want to reinforce. <laughs> and I did forget to add here in the end um, that I did kind of want to talk about. Um, I did. I have a lot of people being I sell seed stock and I, and then I have a, a butcher market. People are always trying to come to me and say, um, "Yeah, will you buy beef from me? Will you buy grass fed beef from me?" And my, honestly, from what I've seen with uh, grass fed carcasses that come across my place, I almost won't buy them unless they are Devon influence. Uh, buy them from them for me to resell to my customers. Um, there's just an insurance policy that I get with the Devons and I've kind of started to build a market around myself um, that uh, if you lease a bull from me, then I'll buy calves back from you, feeders or finished animals or whatever, uh, you know, they're trying to market. So I've tried to build people that, like, if you want to buy, you know, some Devons from me and you have a part Angus herd, you know, I'll still buy those animals back from you and, and be glad to give you well over what market is in, in my area because I just, I'm always seeking after Devons. And it seems like the people that, that have it have markets are, they, they have no problem looking for looking for beef and so if we could reach out to more of those people and and somehow figure out you know we have a breeders list and uh you know lots of people that are raising purebreds but it'd be nice to have somewhere to go to um with crossbred animals that you could have people reference that list or i'm looking for feeders here here's some people that are doing it so somehow we're going to try to work towards that and after I get this webinar behind me, we'll start brainstorming some of these things. Um, but it's something I really think is is value to a lot of people, and uh, and they could also put those animals in the you know the Devon X registry there. Yeah, that's great. All right. Well, eight of nine people have voted. Um, wondering if Becky's the one that uh, she got she's not here anymore all right well um we're gonna shut this down AJ thanks a bunch yeah great job again thanks for setting this whole spring series up look forward to figuring out what we're doing in the fall yeah um thanks to you all for participating um spread the word I mean we some cool stories we're hearing about um people that are raising and selling Devon cattle is that uh, I know a guy out wet or in the Midwest that is selling cattle when he sells an animal to a new breeder, he actually pays for them to become members of the organization. So they're connected to this, to these kinds of conversations. And I think that's neat. Um, it's just neat to see 
some of the life that's happening in the midst of of the breeders and uh, in the community around Devon cattle and people that love to see red animals in our fields and and then eventually on our plates. So thanks AJ for helping us uh, see yeah. things differently. Um, yes, sir. I guess we're going to sign off and um, I'm going to end this poll and we'll be good to go then. Right on. The poll is over. Now, I'll download that. Maybe I should share the results. Who would I share it with? Download so we can save it. Yeah, I just did. Oh. I mean, I hit download. It's coming off as a CSV. Let me make sure then I can send it to you. Uh, Alicia, is she still on? She still can hear me, I'm guessing, Steve. Um, give me a sec. I can come back. Yep, she's there. Should be able to hear you. Um, yeah, so she she had a message here at the end. Uh, what's a marbling like of a oh of a Devon or Devon cross compared to non Devon at same age finished diet? Um, so Jeremy Ng and I have done. So our, the, I guess to clarify, the question is that. Um, we're insinuating that uh, the marbling is going to dictate the tenderness or it is going to be like the ultimate um, end all, I guess, if you could say for if we decide if a crossbred is better than than a Devon. And if that's if that's what we're assuming, then I have to disagree. My my thinking has changed here in the last several years about that because I used to, well, I grew up in a butcher shop, and so they always told me that if it has a marbling, it's choice grade, it's a better, it costs you more money, you sell it for more money, and the customer's always going to be happy. Um, since I've been raising Devon beef, I've, I've sent call cows that were six years old. I've seen some that were 12, 13 years old, and some of those animals, if they, if they wait and fatten those cattle, and then send them, they have so much marbling in them that it's incredible. Um, I've taken those animals and put them on the grill and I've had a six-year-old that tasted excellent. And then I've had a six-year-old that had incredible marbling and it was still tough. And I'm saying, well, this doesn't, this doesn't really add up in my mind. How, if it has marbling, industry tells me that this is supposed to be a tender steak. And so, so what happened here? I'm trying to figure it out. And then I've also had lean, uh, like if, I guess if I go back to my, my one slide um, with those tomahawks, that was out of my red Devon. And it wasn't, there wasn't a ton of marbling in that steak, but that animal was delicious. Like when I cooked those, those steaks, they were unbelievable. And so there's a, there's a tenderness aspect and I don't know, I mean, for simplicity, I think that the USDA grading system has said, okay, let's pinpoint this because about, you know, whatever their percentage is, they said, most of the time, this is going to be what you want. And they, they also go by age. So they're looking at younger animals so that maybe they say, okay, if the animal is this young and has this good of marbling, then it's always going to be a great experience. Um, but I've seen animals that didn't have awesome marbling and they were within that 30 month age. And Jeremy and I actually took some down to Penn State and did some studies. And we haven't, we haven't released all that stuff yet because we just didn't, we wanted to make a real fine tuned, nice video. But anyways, uh, we did shear force testing. And what the shear force testing is, is the bite that you're gonna be, it's mimicking the bite that you're gonna make when you bite into that steak, you're gonna be like shearing those muscles and what does that, what was the tenderness? And <clears throat> what we found with the Red Devon was that even for animals that were close to 30 months of age and going against a grain fed industry standard choice grade um, Angus at probably 13, 14 months old, our shear force testing was very close to what they were doing. And I've seen lots of literature and lots of 
speakers talk about this, that, you know, tenderness is going to give you is age and marbling. But we had animals that were twice the age that were coming close to measuring up with not that didn't marble score as well as that animal. So there's, there's something that wasn't adding up. And so that's, that's what a red Devon gives me. That's what I, that's my insurance policy. There's something there. I can't explain it. Um, the way that the industry is set up for testing, you can't, it's hard to identify. I mean, you can't shear forts, test every animal that's moving through on an assembly line. Some of those people do thousands of carcasses, you know, a day. And so you can't do that, but, and there's not enough Devons really to get it. And then that's what we looked at was, well, as university said, well, if you're going to do any sort of trials, you got to do it over hundred animals or something. Well, we just didn't have that volume. And uh, so with what we did, the five animals we did, the shear force was, you know, did well. And so, like I say, that's, there's just enough proof there that that's my insurance policy. If there's, there's Devon blood in it, then and it, it does well. And, and I haven't had any regrets with that. So <clears throat> there's always a, a one-off. I'm not going to say every single Devon in the whole United States or all over the country is always going to be because you're not going to get that with anything but in all my experiences i've been i've been pleased with with what the devon has brought that's really well said um i had heard it described that um the devons actually have a a real fine fat that's intramuscular you know whereas say a scottish highlander fattens on the outside of its carcass but not intramuscularly the devons have them have fat intramuscular um but it's not it's not as pronounced like a wagyu or you know um it can be pronounced um but that's why they don't dry out that's why there there's a, a real tenderness to it um i wonder if that's some of the stuff that you're talking about aj that makes the difference yeah yeah there's it has its it has its own tenderness trait that, that right. comes with it uh, Alicia asked again, yes, I think the system is set up for fat to equal tenderness, but I've been wondering about this. Fascinating. Thanks so much. I'd love to connect personally and pick your brain more about this uh, a bit more. Well, yeah, anytime. More. I mean, my, my contacts on the breeders list, just go under uh, Anil's Quality Devons. That's my cell number. I think my email's on there. So yeah, but anytime. Yeah, awesome. Talk with you. That's one. That's that's my downfall. If you ask some of my family members, my 11 year old is dad. Why do you always talk so much about cows all the time? It's boring. <laughs> <laughs> my kids call it the cow community. Dad, dad, your cow community is, you know, you're, you're working with your cow community. <laughs> like we love that our cattle more than we love our kids. Oh yeah. Um, uh, yes. Good to know. Brad's been working on you to, um, to, to do it, Alicia. That's awesome. Yeah. At least I'm, he's doing I'm, something. I'm glad that, uh, <laughs> I'm glad that you, you attended too. I appreciate that. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to stop the recording and, uh, sign off here. I got to go, uh, take care of some water lines here before they freeze. <laughs> hey, thanks everyone. Yeah. Thank you, thanks. AJ. Talk to you soon. See ya. See